This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Disputes over the islands in the South China Sea have been going on for nearly a century. Disquiet rose in the 2010s after China and other countries started developing and militarizing the islands and reached a peak in 2020, when the Trump administration started increasing the number of US Navy ships in the region. However, after a period of relative calm, tensions have peaked once again after a series of escalating skirmishes between the Chinese and Filipino navies, which came to a head last week, when Chinese sailors attacked their Filipino counterparts with machetes and hammers in disputed waters off 2nd Thomas Shoal. So in this video, we're going to look at why China is so keen on the South China Sea Islands, these recent developments, and why this is bad news for a region that's looking increasingly unstable. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start with some context. The South China Sea is a 3.5 million square kilometer bit of sea that lies, unsurprisingly, south of China and Taiwan, in between Vietnam and the Philippines, and north of Brunei and Malaysia. It holds two groups of islands, the Spratly Islands in the south and the Paracel Islands in the north. The dispute is basically a territorial dispute between those six countries about who has territorial rights in the area, and a lot of the tension revolves around China's somewhat expansive claim. China claims historic rights to about 80-90% to 90 of the South China Sea via what's known as the Nine Dash Line, which is based on an unofficial 1936 map by Chinese cartographer Bai Meichu. China's claims are clearly inconsistent with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, to which China is a signatory which defines a state's territorial zone as being 12 nautical miles from a state's coast, and its exclusive economic zone as being 200 miles. For context, the furthermost point of China's Nine Dash Line is about 1,200 miles from its shore. Obviously, China's claim has also generated some tension with other South China Sea countries, not just because it contradicts their own territorial claims, but also because, at the moment, each of the six South China Sea countries occupies at least one island in the Spratlys or the Paracels, which they sometimes have to defend from Chinese aggression. Now, in the 1990s and 2000s, this wasn't really a problem, and the various countries didn't really fight over the islands. However, since about 2010, tensions have steadily escalated, largely because that's when the CCP started militarizing and developing the islands, including dredging the nearby seabed to artificially make them bigger. Now, the CCP weren't actually the first to do this. Vietnam and the Philippines, for example, had engaged in similar practices in the past, but the scale of the Chinese program is unmatched, and in the past couple of years, China has also begun developing previously unoccupied features, in violation of an agreement signed by the South China Sea countries in 2011. The CCP's increasingly forward-leaning policy here is probably a reflection of their growing anxieties about trade dependencies. For context, the South China Sea is the second most used sea lane in the world, after the Dover Strait and something like 60% of China's total trade and 80% of its oil imports transit through the region. Anyway, Chinese policymakers have long worried about the possibility of a trade embargo cutting off their essential imports in the event of a conflict, and controlling the South China Sea mitigates these risks. Beijing's anxieties here have only been exacerbated by the US, which started performing what it describes as freedom of navigation exercises around the area in about 2013, and then stepped up their frequency under Trump. This basically involves US vessels sailing near or around features claimed by China, essentially exercising their rights under the UN Charter on the law of the sea and asserting the Charter's legitimacy by violating China's illegitimate maritime claims. It's worth noting that this is pretty hypocritical, because the US Senate hasn't actually ratified the Charter, but it still goes around enforcing it. Anyway, tensions have subsequently been on the rise ever since, but things have become especially dangerous between China and the Philippines in the past few months. The China-Philippines dispute mostly centers around the Second Thomas Shoal, which is basically a protruding reef about 200 kilometers from Palawan, but more than 1,000 kilometers from China's southern Hainan Island. The shoal is widely considered part of the Philippines, and an international tribunal in 2016 ruled that China had no legal rights to the shoal, which lies within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. The shoal has been occupied by a contingent of Philippine Marines since 1999, when the Philippines deliberately ran a World War II-era ship called the Sierra Madre aground on the reef to reinforce its territorial claim. These marines have to be resupplied every month or so, and for the past few months, Chinese ships have been trying to interrupt these resupply efforts using increasingly violent tactics, including water cannons, lasers, and even melee weapons. 
This is probably because China suspects the Philippines of secretly reinforcing the Sierra Madre, which is sort of falling apart. While Manila denies this, last week the FT reported that officials close to the situation had privately admitted that they had indeed reinforced it. This has provoked irritation from the CCP, which has basically been waiting 25 years for the ship to disintegrate so they can nick the shoal. Anyway, things came to a head on Monday last week, when the Chinese Coast Guard rammed a Filipino resupply boat while brandishing makeshift spears, which ended with one Filipino soldier losing their finger. It's not clear from the footage whether or not the Chinese Coast Guard actually boarded the Filipino ships, but comments by Filipino soldiers claiming that their weapons were seized suggests they did, at least temporarily. This would be an unprecedented escalation, but not entirely unforeseen, given that just last week Beijing published new regulations allowing its Coast Guard to both board and use lethal force against foreign ships in its claimed territorial waters. Now, Manila have since said that they don't quite consider the incident to be an act of war, and Filipino President Marcos Jr. has in the past said that it would require the death of a Philippine service member or citizen, quote, by a willful act for the Philippines to declare war. Nonetheless, this is deeply worrying for two reasons. Firstly, the two sides are stuck in an escalatory spiral. While they've committed to a bilateral negotiation on the issue sometime in July, it's hard to see these talks coming to a productive conclusion, given that neither side has shown any willingness to give up its territorial claim. Secondly, the Philippines has a 70-year-old mutual defense treaty with the US with a NATO-style Article 5 clause, and if Manila did deem Beijing's actions to constitute war, it would oblige the US to get involved. In March, the US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin confirmed that the treaty extended to the South China Sea, and last week US Secretary of State Antony Blinken reaffirmed what he described as America's ironclad commitments to the Philippines. Whilst public comments suggest that China doesn't want war with the Philippines, let alone the US, and World War III still looks overwhelmingly unlikely, if the past few years have taught us anything, it's that escalatory spirals can be surprisingly hard to diffuse. Looking around the political stage, there's a good number of people who are probably eyeing up new jobs at the moment, so it might be a good time for Rishi & Co to grab a subscription to Brilliant. That's because Brilliant is the platform where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming and AI, all of which are important skills whether you're currently in the jobs market or just looking to learn new things. As existing users will already know, Brilliant is a uniquely effective learning platform. Their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. Plus, if you are looking for a new job, say you're eyeing up a move to California to get into tech, Brilliant's growing number of programming courses are a great way to build foundations and learn real-world applications. Their courses help you learn essential coding elements, from loops and variables to nesting and conditionals, as well as developing your mind to think like a programmer, building a strong foundation in writing robust programs. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, click on the link in the description. Plus, when you do subscribe, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.